I'm going to ask you to stand right now, and um, here's what we're going to do. You can, you can certainly open your Bible, but we're going to be running through various uh, scriptures for our congregational reading. Uh, and so I'm going to ask you to put your eyes to the screen. We're going to be reading out of the New King James Version on the screen uh, together. And we are looking at, in this series, titled The Futures, looking at what the Bible says regarding prophecy itself. And we're looking at a, a, a message today titled, uh, He's Coming for You. And I want you to think about that. Jesus Christ is coming back. But you've got to stop and ask, why is he coming back? And there's a lot of reasons he's fulfilling Bible prophecy. There are things that God, who is te technically bound by his word, I say that affectionately, because God's actions are inseparable from his word, church. God, God's will will be done. But he doesn't do that uh, regretfully. God executes his will because that is his mind. That is his person. That's what he does. And the Bible says that God must keep his word. He must be faithful to his word. And he doesn't do it like, oh, no, I said that 2,000 years ago and I got to be true to it. No, he said it 2,000 years ago because he's the God that never changes. And what is going to happen in the future according to Bible prophecy, will happen exactly according to God's will. And so when we talk about all of the aspects of Bible prophecy, we are talking mainly for us concerning the fact that he is coming for you. He's coming for us. So before I read or we read together, I want to just give you this verse to set it all up first. Jesus says, but take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, or the things of this life, everything he lists here, things of this life, carousing, drunkenness, the cares of this life, that that day come upon you unexpectedly. That's when he comes. Don't let it surprise you. For it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the earth. Watch therefore, and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. That's Luke 21, verses 34 to 36, very powerful. So church, here we go. I will read the odd-numbered verses in this particular section, and then before we move on, I'll let you know where we're reading from next. Matthew 7, 13 is our first reading. If you'd pick it up in verse 14, Jesus said, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. He says there that beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. And I've stopped right there at verse 16, right in the middle of that. Now Matthew 7.21. Matthew 7.21, I'll begin. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Verse 23, then I, that's Jesus speaking, will declare to them, I never knew you, depart from me. Now, John chapter 10, verse 26, I'll begin. John 10, 26, but you do not believe because you are not of my sheep, as I said to you. I give them eternal life and they shall never Perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father has given them to me, and then verse 30 I and my Father are one. Romans chapter 8, verse 35 Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress? or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are healed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things to come. 
Verse 39 will end here. Nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Father, Lord, as we approach you in our study today, those collection of passages could not be more comforting and more terrorizing than to hear that there will be those in the day of judgment who even did miracles. They cast out demons. They preached in your name. Only to hear in the day of judgment that you didn't even know who they were. And then we hear the comfort, Lord, of those who are your fold, those who are of your sheep, and how nothing will be able to separate us from your love. And so, God, as we look at this study today and we examine where we really are in the prophetic scene, in the nearness of Christ's return, we ask you, Father, that you would inhabit now the praises of your people in the study of your word. And we pray it now in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. 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 You can be seated, church. I am continually, as I mentioned last week, blessed, excited, and thankful for the response of people who are saying that this is a study that they need. It's a study that they have avoided in many other ways, but uh, they've come now at a time like this. And listen, don't tell me God's not working in the world, that they've come to a time like this, that due to the world's events, it has opened up their hearts and minds to study what the Bible says about the future. That's a great thing. Who would ever re redo 2020 or even 2021 for that matter? But listen, I would for this reason, for the spiritual benefits of it. People are thinking, people are asking questions, people are wondering, what's next? And listen, if you're looking around the world right now and you're wondering, well, what's next? Hey, concerning the world itself and what political leader or what group is going to say what or do what, I don't know. I can't say, but I can tell you this, God's word is sure, and what God says will happen, and what God has to say to all those who trust him is very, very good and very, very exciting, and what God has to say to those who don't want anything to do with them in life, or just simply live a life of neglect toward God, the end is very, very sad. It's a decision that you'll have to make. So church, let's dive right into this as we look at our study regarding the fact he's coming for you. That's something you want to be sure about. Is Number one is this, that he's coming for you, so make sure you're on the right path. That's obvious. See, Jack, this is basic. Yeah, yeah, I know it's basic. That's why we're doing it. You need to make sure you're on the right path. And might I submit to you today that it's not as easy as you think it, it was maybe 30 years ago or 100 years ago? Uh, the pathway back in those days seemed to be a lot less cluttered than it is today. When we talk about the path, that I'm talking about you being a believer on the right path that is acceptable to God. Listen, my dear friends, not you, not me, but it's acceptable to God. It's what God has approved of. It's what God says. Now, I know that when you and I punch in a destination on our GPS or on our our phones or our cars or whatever it might be, you've noticed that your, your built-in GPS system's got features on it, and some of those features are things like this. It will avoid accidents. It will avoid toll roads. It, would, it will avoid whatever. But if you set your GPS for destination the fastest route, that's how my, I don't know how yours is set, you know, You might select the more scenic route, which I, I wish they had that one, by the way, but I guess that's based upon your opinion. But the one about fastest route, that's the one I want. That's the one I hit. But in that, you've noticed that when you select that, it will then tell you you've got three different op options, and uh, each of them are about two minutes apart. Have you seen that? And you can pick the fastest one. These are the, the top three that appear on, on the destination route of what's fastest. And you have these decisions to make. And now today, you and I are living in a, a world of, quote, Christianity that has all these other peripheral things that are available for you to pick. And I got to tell you, that's not a good idea. 
It may be great on your GPS about getting to uh, the beach in time or Disneyland or wherever you're going to go. But when it comes to getting to heaven, can you imagine you type in uh, uh, heaven, right? 777 Paradise Lane, <laughs> heaven. And it pops up and it says, you have three options. No, I, I, got, I got news for you. You got one option, which is no option. <laughs> You've got one choice. So be very careful because today, and I'm not going to do it. Don't, don't respond when I say this. You always do. I could name names of famous Christian leaders today that have now departed from that way, that path, and are offering alternative routes based upon your gender, based upon your race, based upon your ethnicity. Are you hearing me? They now have departed. Famous names. And it's sickening and it's tragic. And yet when I read it and see it, I understand that Jesus warned about times just like this. The question that you want to make sure that you can answer is that are you on the right path? Are you sure you're on the right path? Because he's coming for you. He's coming for you. Let me tell you what being on the right path doesn't mean. This is what it doesn't mean. Uh, here's an example about how not to be <laughs> on the right path. Mark chapter 10, verse 17. Mark 10, 17. The Bible says, now as he was going out on the road, this is Jesus, one came running, knelt down before him and asked him. Three things this person did. Whoever he is, let's not read ahead. Whoever he is, this person came to Jesus. This person knelt down. And this person asked him, three things that I want to ask myself regarding the path that I'm on. Am I coming to Jesus? This guy starts out good. He comes to Jesus. He kneels down in homage or reverence to Jesus. And then he asks him. And I have to ask myself, am I approaching Christ this way? Am I on the right path? Does he have my reverence? Does he have my request when I speak or ask him. So this guy seems to be very focused. He seems to be right on target, so to speak. And then he says something extremely powerful, but we don't know what his answer is to this when asked. He says to Jesus, good teacher, what shall I do that I might inherit eternal life? So he calls Jesus good teacher. You and I do not get this in our uh, Western world but this is what it's meant in the Middle Eastern world at that time and even, day, even to this day. When the statement is made, good teacher, uh, the, the word means, by the way, the word good, in original English, because of the uh, Latin and the Greek, good is always reserved for God. I don't know if you know that or not. It was not supposed to be used toward anything else but God. Uh, so when he says good teacher, he's saying God's teacher. That's what he's really saying. You know how you and I say good morning? You know, we don't even know what we're saying. The original English was God's morning to you. Amen. Good night. Oh, that meant early on. They didn't say good night 400 years ago. They didn't say good night. They said God's night. It was a blessing. God's night be upon ye. Then that was shortened to, you know how you spell goodbye and what is thought of as Old English, right? By, a B-Y-E. It's actually, again, all polluted from God's night be upon you. When we would say good day or good afternoon, it's God's afternoon upon you. It's a blessing. God's morning be upon you, friend. God's afternoon be upon you, friend. It's been shortened up to good because it's reserved only for God. Of course, Jesus, knowing great English, Latin, and Greek, I'm kidding, I'm, I'm just, this is God speaking, he says something very profound. He says, why do you call me good? Isn't that interesting? Jesus says to this young man, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. And then he answers him, you know the commandments, do not commit adultery. Dear friends, if you're not committing adultery today, you don't get brownie points for that. You don't get an award. Hey, can I have an award? I haven't committed adultery. No, you don't get an award for that. You're not supposed to commit adultery. You don't get points for 
not doing what you're not supposed to do. <laughs> do not murder. I haven't murdered in weeks, Pastor. Can, <laughs> can I have an award? No, you're not supposed to murder. Do not steal. Same thing. Do not bear false witness. Don't lie. And do not defraud. Don't rip people off. Honor your father and mother. And the man answered and said to him, Teacher, all these things I've kept from my youth. He's not lying. Everything that you said, Jesus, I have physically not done. And this is where Christianity, true biblical Christianity, departs from, for example, Judaism. I have good friends who are Jewish, and they'll, they'll say, it doesn't matter what you think, it doesn't matter what you imagine, it's what you do that matters. That's, look, as citizens, we appreciate that kind of commitment to visible morality, but that doesn't fly in the face of God, does it? God says, I care about what you're thinking about, I care about what you meditate on. Isn't that amazing? Think about the reality of Christ, and all of a sudden, being on the right path is something that is not a bunch of do's and don'ts and thou shalt nots and give me the boxes to check and see if I match up to the requirements. None of that. It all comes down to the spirit of the matter. Who is it inside of you that makes you who you are? And are you on the right path in following Jesus? And he goes on to say, verse 21, Then Jesus looked at him, loved him, and said to him, One thing you lack... Go your way, sell whatever you have, pay attention church, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, take up your cross and follow me. You know what's amazing about that statement? Jesus answers him in, on the level of where he's thinking. He's thinking, I've not done these things, so I'm good, right? I'm okay. Jesus comes down to where he's at and says, if that's the case, good for you. If that's the way you're going to judge yourself, how does Jesus make this guy see the reality of it? If this guy's stuck in the physical side of performance, how does Jesus get him to look on the inside? Look what he says. That's one thing you lack. Go take everything that you have and sell it. And give it to the poor and you'll have eternal life. Ladies and gentlemen, is that the gospel that's preached in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and all the epistles to this day, that you'll go to heaven if you give all that you own to the poor? That's not the gospel. What's Jesus doing? Jesus is exposing to the man the man's own value flaws. You think, you think young man, that living this way by what you do and do not do makes you right? Well, then let's just take your logic to the end. You see, Jesus gets him where he's at. You're a rich young man. This is, the, this is the story of the rich young ruler. Give all that you have. You want to get on the right path? Give all of your material wealth up and you'll be saved. No. The shock is what Jesus says to him is that if you think good works get you into heaven, then do this. The man couldn't do it. The man was defeated in his own logic. Friends and family, listen right now. You may think you're on the right path going to heaven. And it's my job this morning to shake you. To cause you to think. Because if I were to ask you right now, are you going to go to heaven? I ask this audience and I ask those of you that are watching right now. Are you going to go to heaven if you die? If you have an answer that is opposite to the gospel, then you're not going. And I say that sadly. Because God wants you to go. We want you to go. But if you have an answer that's different than what Christ has prescribed, you're in trouble. And so what Jesus does is he exposes the man to himself. He sees inside and he looks and concludes. Watch what happens. Watch the result of this. Verse 22 says, but he was sad. The man was sad at this word. And he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. And I would say that's, he had great possessions, but he didn't possess them. He had great possessions that possessed him. We all, by the, by the way, we all battle with that. 
The moment we buy a new shirt or a new car or a new whatever, there's that sense of, you stand up a little straighter. Or you pull up to the stoplight and you have a different attitude all of a sudden. What's that all about? Watch out, that's the possession trying to get on you, trying to get in you. And this man was owned by what he had. He was on a path of success. He was on a path of impression. He was young. And he was on the path of power. He was a ruler. When you read the four Gospels, you put it all together regarding this young man because he appears in three of the Gospels. He's rich, he's young, and he's a man of authority. Uh, the generation I come from, he would have been a yuppie. I don't know what they are today. First of all, are there, anyth- are there anything like yuppies today? I think it died out in my generation. Rich, young rulers. And then Jesus says regarding this, that Jesus looked around and said to the disciples how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. What's interesting about that is Jesus didn't say you, you can't have riches. He's talking about riches possessing you. Why? Because it places you on a path of your own decision making. Notice the people that are plaguing your life today. I want to rub that in. I want to turn that knife a little bit. The people that are plaguing your life today are multi-billionaires and they're manipulating your, your social media all the time and they're corrupt, and they're evil, and their actions have proven it. So, in fact, in fact, Mike Lindell hired a bunch of world-renowned analysts to, to analyze the, the actual data of the election, and now it's been published, and here's the deal. You saw the, you saw the big launch, and some news agencies put it up, and then they took it down. I think OAN is the only one that's playing it right now on their channels. And all of this stuff, he's got the real people with their real credentials, with real data uh, recorded in real time. You get to watch it. And it's, it's 100% proof of what happened on November 3rd. And here's the deal. It's so true that Facebook and YouTube pulled it off. That's how true it is. Think about it. But you can see it. I, I was told you can go to MikeLindell.com and you can watch it. And uh, it's science. It's just pure science. The point is nobody's interested in that anymore because we don't want that level of truth. Jesus introduces the truth and he challenges us. What path are you on? And a lot of people today have an appetite. Just lie to me. Pastor, just lie to me. Tell me what I want to hear. Tell me what makes me feel good. I want to go to a church that just gives me the, gives me the, warms, the warm and fuzzies so I can go, uh, and, and I'm, by the time Friday comes, I'm so worn out and beat up and I, uh, that I'll get, a, I'll get an injection of fuzzy on Sunday and I'll just live like that. Let me tell you something about that. Churches who teach like that and churches who function that way, where are those, where are those people today? Where are those ministries today? When life punches you in the face, that warm and fuzzy goes out the window quick. And when you fall back, you better fall back on the word of God and God's promises. And you better know God's word because when the world gives you a punch, warm and fuzzy goes out the window like frosting on a cake. It's a serious day when the gospel's been ejected for for social argumentation that we're not going to preach Christ anymore. What we're going to wind up doing is talking about either uh, Black Lives Matter or social justice or all these things cloaked in the pulpit. The only answer to Black Lives Matter and social justice is the gospel. And when you depart from the gospel, you go down the path of falsehood. You're on the wrong path. It's the wrong path. Ministries today are focusing on, listen, the ripples that come. When the rock hits the pool and the ripples go out and you focus on the ripples, you're focusing on the wrong thing. You need to focus on the rock. Whatever it was that hit, what what caused it? And what's wrong with America today is that we are reaping from having not sown to the word of God as a culture. It's very true. Why? We're on the wrong path. We want to be careful about that. The Bible says in Proverbs 16, verse 25, there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end is the way of death. 
Are you on the right path? Proverbs 12, 15 is similar to it. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes. That's tough. Man, that's hard because when a fool thinks he's on the right path, you can't get him off. And here's the thing. Everybody knows he's a fool, but he thinks he's genius. Everybody's going, what a fool. And, th- and he thinks, those people are dumb. They don't get it. He's a legend in his own mind. But the truth is to be on the right path is to, listen, is to not only possess, listen, possess the orthodoxy of scripture. That is, what does the Bible say? It's not only that, and you know the answer to this, it's after you study the Bible, then what do you do? According to the Bible, you're supposed to live it. You're supposed to do it. When that truth gets inside of us, and I I wrote these three things down. I don't know if they'll bless you or not, but regarding the truth that's in me, within us, I need to be careful that I don't mix it with the element. I don't need to mix it with elements of this world, elements. It'll be more clear in a second. When the truth is inside of me, I need to make sure that I don't add pollutants to it. Another word, add elements to the gospel, elements to biblical doctrine, add things to it as, as we get further along in t- the 21st century. Watch out. Again, the things of this world are pollutants, that the gospel does not become corrupt. I want to make sure I guard the truth that's inside of me and I don't mix it with contaminants. Am I on the right path? Church family, please, please heed this warning. Watch out. There are so many voices and so many ways for you to get, quote, data, quote, into your lap or into your eyes and head that it could easily, easily become elements that corrupt the gospel in your life, pollutants and contaminants that begin to cast a little bit of doubt on the veracity of God's word and you begin to not view it so powerful or so pure. And it can corrupt you. Are you on the right path? Galatians 3, verse 1. Galatians 3, 1. The apostle Paul warned the church at Galatia. And I love Paul. You got to love Paul. He's just so direct, always. Galatians 3, 1. Listen to him. He says, oh, foolish Galatians. We would say today, you bozos. (laughs) Who has bewitched you? He's talking to Christians. Can you imagine if Paul showed up today? And our guest speaker this morning is Paul the Apostle. And he comes up, you Chino Hillians, you. (laughs) Who has bewitched you? And we would say, Mark Zuckerberg. (laughs) Facebook. TikTok. Twitter. Who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? For whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish having begun in the spirit? Are you now being made perfect or complete in the flesh? You know why that verse is on the screen right now this morning? Because I heard a famous Christian leader this week say regarding his understanding now, his new revelation of critical race theory, he says, that for the last 30 years, he thought he was preaching the gospel. But now he knows the gospel. That the gospel is the gospel of injustice. And I immediately picked up the phone to find out if we have any of that guy's books in our bookstore. Because he's telling me that for the last 30 years he wasn't preaching the gospel. He's got a new one. A more full gospel. Ladies and gentlemen, this is exactly what he's warning about. Watch out. By the way, yes, I'm actually exercising right now in front of you negative church growth tactics. 
this message is going to cause you to have a much easier time next week finding a parking spot. Nobody wants to hear this stuff. Galatians chapter 1, verse 22. Galatians 1, excuse me, James 1, 22. James chapter 1, verse 22 says, but be doers of the word. Here it is. Let's not just have an orthodoxy of scripture. It's practical living. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Isn't that amazing? You can go to a Bible study. This is horrific. You can go to a Bible study. You can go to all kinds of Bible studies. But if you don't intend to do it, the truth you do here winds up becoming a, a pollutant to you. The truth doesn't pollute. It's what it's being housed in. A heart takes in the word without intentions to ever do it. That heart becomes corrupt. That's how the word of God can judge. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. I'm sorry, but this is very funny. You look in a mirror. Hmm. You look, that's me. And it's funny because let's be honest. You look in a mirror and you see what you see, but it's processed with your own eyes. And when you look, it's like, I'm good. Watch what happens. He observes himself and he goes away and immediately forgets what kind of a man he was because to expound, he doesn't see the nose hair coming out of his nose. He did, listen, he doesn't see the booger that's on his cheek. He doesn't see that he still has some yolk from breakfast on this side of his mouth. He looks and he goes, I'm good. And he goes out and he forgets that what he looked at in the mirror had these things that needed to be fixed. And he goes out into the world thinking he's fine. The Bible says, watch out. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. Matthew 7, 13. We read it a moment ago in our introduction. Jesus said, enter in by the narrow gate. You want to talk about the path? The narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction or to hell. And there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. Jesus is not saying it's difficult to get to heaven because you've got to work at it. No, 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 no. Listen, it's difficult to get to heaven because every day it takes you and I saying, Jesus is Lord. Amen. Jesus is Lord. You know, we face that every day, church. Every day we get up. Who's going to be Lord? We have to choose. Right? I mean, it's true. And there's people, I get it, I, I emotionally get it, where people wake up and they just go, I want to take a break today. Don't you emotionally feel like that sometimes? I'd like to emotionally not answer my phone for a day. The other day I got just under 200 texts in one day, and I looked at them, because I was busy, and then I looked and it was up 200. And I looked and I just went, I, I don't feel like looking at those. And then you know what happened in my mind? My mind is this. You don't look at them now, and there'll be 400 tomorrow. <laughs> but because of fatigue or whatever, you want to kind of check out for a moment. That's where Christianity happens. I want to quit, but I will not. I, I, don't, I don't want to think of the things of the Spirit today. I just want to veg, but I won't. You know why? Because your old flesh will pop right out into the scene and say, hey, let's do something stupid today. <laughs> Luke chapter 6, verse 46. Jesus said, but why do you call me Lord? Listen to this. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things I say? Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood rose or arose, the stream beat vehemently against the house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. But he who heard and did nothing is like the man who built his house on the earth or sand without a foundation against which the streams beat vehemently and immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. Foundations, that's what I'm talking about. Are you on the right path? Of course, if you had to immediately give one verse about the right path, it would mean that you and I believe 
the verse that I'm about to say. John 14, 6. You all know it very well. And Jesus said to him, I am the way. Def, notice, notice this definite article in front of way. Definite article in front of truth. Definite article in front of life. Jesus says, I am the way. The moment Jesus said that, it excluded all other ways. Well, I believe, I'm just sincere. I'm sincere about what I believe. Everybody, listen, everyone is sincere about what they believe. Jesus is saying what you believe better be in line with the way. <laughs> See, man, that's narrow. That's what I'm saying. It is narrow. And then he says, he's the truth. Well, I just graduated from Stanford and I just learned that my truth is just as good as your truth. We all have our truth. Can you imagine telling God that? You should let me in because my truth tells me there is no your truth. I know that's offensive for somebody who thinks more highly of themselves than they ought to. It's just like, are you kidding me? Do you know who I am? Do you know what kind of education or do you know what kind of life experience I have? Listen, I'm grateful for your life's experience and for who you are. I'm try Listen, I'm trying to give you the truth to make sure that you're on the right path so that you enter into heaven. And it is the way and the truth. All of man's thinking is to come under the submission of his truth. Amen. That's being a follower of Jesus. And then he says that he is the life. And he says, no one comes to the Father except through me. Man, is that narrow? Whew. Point number two today is this. He's coming for you, so make sure you're known by him. Make sure that you're known by him. It's so easy for us to say, I, I know God. I mean, come on, you say, I, I know God, I know God. And then you can, hear the, you can almost hear the, the reverberation back in your head where, I know God, I know God. And then the thought comes, but does God know you? Think about it, church. I, I've thought about how to stress this, and then I just totally gave up and just realized, Holy Spirit, you have to do this because it's not human. I can't do this. I thought, you know, you stand on my head, make some big thing, make some big, big uh, uh, prop to try to get you to see this. The, the truth is this. We can say that we know him, but we need to know if he knows, uh, if he knows who we are. We need to know this. It would be horrific to live life assuming. Can you imagine? Well, I assumed he knew me. We read it a moment ago when those who did miraculous feats in his name, in his name, can you imagine? And yet, they never knew him. How's that even possible? Matthew 7, 22, we read it. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord. So they got his title right. Lord, Lord. Do I, do we ever call him Lord? Have we not prophesied in your name? Preached. Haven't we preached in your name? Can you imagine, according to Jesus, there are going to be preachers and pastors and Bible teachers that will stand before him in the day of judgment who are going to say this. Wait a minute. I've preached in your name. I cast out demons in your name. Church, how many demons have you cast out this week? <laughs> These guys did it. And I've done many wonders in your name. I've done miracles in your name. Jesus doesn't deny any of those things. You want to know why? Because God honors the name of his son Jesus. That's why. They did those things. They're not lying. They did those things because God honors his son. They, listen, oh boy. <laughs> they associated their acceptance to God or with God based upon what they did, but they used his power and his name, right? His Bible. But none of that was inside of them in reality.
And Jesus will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Therefore, whoever hears the sayings of mine and does them, I will liken unto him as a wise man who built his house on the rock. And then Jesus goes to tell us about foundations. Can you imagine? That are, listen, this verse, Matthew 7, 22, 21, 22, 23, we need to ask ourselves, am I on the right path? And do, do I have the assurance that he knows me? To be known by Jesus requires that he has access to you. You can't know somebody you don't have access to. In fact, listen, you can, be a, you, can be, you can be in a relationship that's six weeks old or 60 years old. The criteria is it's only a relationship if that other person has access to you. If they don't, it's just a company or it's just an acquaintance. Jesus doesn't want to be a company to you or an institution. Jesus doesn't want to be an acquaintance to you. John chapter 14, verse 7. John, Are you guys okay? John 14, verse 7 says this. Jesus is speaking. If you had known me, the word is gnosko. Gnosko means, watch this. It is, um, it's this. Gnosko is this. That's a Bible. Gnosko means, that's a Bible? I can turn its pages. That's gnosko. I read it. That's gnosko. It tells me how I ought to live. That's gnosko. It's not just identified. That's Jesus. That is gnosko. But if you leave it there, something's wrong because gnosko means you not only recognize him, you name his name, you read his book, you sing, you pray. But if the life is not in you, it's not gnosko. It means an experiential knowledge Of something, and in this case, it's Jesus and Jesus of you. So, if you had known me, he said, you would have known my Father also. Can I change it this way? If you had experienced me, had knowledge of, and walked with me, talked with me, you would have also had knowledge of, walked with, and talked with my Father also. And from now on, you experience me, walk with me, uh, relate to me. He says, know him and have seen him. So are you kidding me? The Bible says nobody can see God and live. Isn't that amazing? Jesus says, if you know me in that experiential way, where it's not just theology, but it's practice also, it's a living knowledge of me, and that you and I are walking this path and knowing one another this way, you're going to know my father and you're going to see him. Isn't that weird? Because we're not allowed to see the father. Not until we die will we see the father. You can't see him. The Bible says that nobody could look at the father and live. That's why God had to take Moses, remember? And he stuffed Moses in a crack of a rock on Mount Sinai. And then the Bible says God hid Moses' body with his hand before his face passed by. Can you imagine? Moses goes, I want to see you. God says, oh man. Well, you can't see me and live, but let me I'll work something out here. <laughs> oh, by the way, and I love this part too. There's a crack in the rock right there. Oh, because that's a big crack to stick Moses in. So you've seen big cracks like that in rocks. And here's my thing. On Mount Sinai, how long, is that, how long had that rock been there cracked? Since creation, I don't know. You can't answer. I can't answer. Here's what's fun. God anticipated the encounter. God didn't crack a rock. The rock was already cracked. Why? Because God knew he was going to meet Moses right there someday in the future. So God takes Moses and stuffs him in the rock. I think this, in my mind, I I see his hand and (laughs) leg sticking out. He's... (laughs) God covers him with his hand. Imagine, God's hand covers Moses' body. This is to keep Moses alive. I love the science of this. God passes by, watch, He tells Moses, you'll see my afterglow. The word is afterglow. You'll see when I pass by, listen to this. God's God's appearance as spirit so disrupted the physical atmosphere that was around Moses that when God passed through, imagine God now letting go 
of moving his hand away from Moses. And when Moses opened his eye, eyes, he could only see the atmospheric disturbance of where God was. And Moses' face was fried. Remember, remember the Bible says his face was altered, his countenance. It was like, it's like radiation, man. <clears throat> From the glory of God. And can you imagine Moses? Remember, he had to put a bag on his head. He had to put a, a, he had to put a veil on his head. Because he was going down the mountain and he didn't want to see the children, the children of Israel looking at his face diminishing. Because he was in the presence of God. Can you imagine he comes down? Can you imagine somebody says, excuse me, Moses, is that you? Yes, it is. What happened? I found out that previously I knew God. But now I find, found out that God knows me. God's glory is revealed to you when he knows you. That's why Bible study only takes you halfway. Because once you study a verse of the Bible, then God says, okay, now go do it. Right now, for example, I mean this. Right now, for, as an example, you can't go into hospitals. They're all closed and shut up. Stupid, stupid, stupidest idea possible, in my opinion. People are dying alone. How cruel is that? Oh, but somebody could get sick. I'll risk it. Someone's dying alone. What a satanic way to keep the gospel from people who are open to the gospel, but no one's there. Sorry, I just went off a rabbit trail on that one. If you can't go in the hospital and pray for people, you know what? You can go to the hospital parking lot and stand out in front or get out there and just say, Lord, just start reaching people in that building. You know what? Because listen... There's a time to encounter God. And it's God's will that you know him and it's God's will that you be known by God. That's what he desires. The Bible tells us, and I love this, the Bible tells us in Luke chapter 10, verse 18, and Jesus said to them, this is the disciples, now they're growing. It went from 12 to 70 of them. I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. That's a great thing. So what are you saying that for, Jesus? Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any, any means hurt you. <laughs> um, this would have been a great theme verse for 2020. <laughs> Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this that the spirits or the demons are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Oh, can you imagine? Can you imagine? Jesus says, now go and preach the gospel. Okay, here we go. And you preach the gospel. And communities are getting saved. Miracles are happening and demons are running away from you. And you go back to Jesus and you say, it works. It works. Your gospel works. Wow, that was amazing. We not only know you, but while we were away from you preaching and ministering, we discovered that you know us. And Jesus says, that's very, very cool. But listen, remember this. Best thing of all, rejoice, not in that, but in the fact that your names are written down in heaven. Amen. Your names. Is your name written down in heaven? When you lay your head down tonight, are you absolutely sure that your name is written down in heaven? Number three, make sure you're being faithful. We don't need to belabor this, just challenge you on this. Be faithful. He's coming for you, so make sure that you're being faithful. The word faithful means being reliable to what God has called you to do. It means that he can trust you with what he's given you to do. This is beautifully liberating, friend. You, 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 not the person next to you, you, specifically you. Think about it, as, as unique as a snowflake is. You know, I believe people when they say that. I've never looked at a snowflake. I'm told every one of them's different. Okay, I haven't looked, so I'll, I'll go with the science on that if that's science. And the Hallmark card says you're as unique as a snowflake. <laughs> okay, I... I know that's true. You are unique. Here's the thing. God is saying to you, 
Whoever you are, who you know me and I know you, be faithful to why I gave you life. See, when we're unfaithful, I don't mean this in any other way except I'm gonna, uh, this is life. I, this is my life. I want to I wanna do this. I want to do that. I want to I wanna do my thing. It's not necessarily something. In fact, let me put it to you this way. It's not necessarily something evil that they're saying. They don't know anything. They're, they're non-Christians. They don't know. And they're trying, look, let's be honest. They're doing the best they can to make their life mean something, right? Why do people have uh, sexual exploits or uh, drug-induced uh, events or uh, power grabbing? And, and Why do they do that? Because they're trying to find meaning. Don't be so mean to them because you used to be just like them. Have we forgotten that he's rescued us from this? We need to be gentle and kind and loving, and we need to reach out to them. Pray first, and then reach out to them. The truth is, they're trying to get what you have, or they're trying to get what Jesus gives for free. They don't know that. So they're trying to figure out, how do I fill this void in my life? They're not necessarily the spawn of Satan. They just may not know Jesus. And we can so focus down, oh, look at what you're doing, look what you're doing. Look, I've told you before, church, when, a, when somebody I don't know walks up and says, hi, I'm a Christian, I, I'm in my mind, I go, hey, nice to meet you. In my mind, I'm going, oh, boy, what do we got here? Because you don't know, I don't know. They have named a name. They put themselves in a category. Are they in pursuit of Christ? Are they in submission to his word? If somebody comes up and says, hey, I'm a full-blown atheist, well, I can relax. Are you with me? I don't expect anything from them. If they say, hey, you know what? I'm a full-blown atheist, and I was thinking about going over there and, and doing this and doing that, and of course you were. That's what, that's what I used to do before I, I was a follower, Right? You're going to be faithful to something or to someone. Jesus says, be faithful to me. Be faithful to me. God has given each of you something to do in this life for his glory. You are to find out what it is. And when you find it, run with it. God made you for a purpose. Listen, don't, don't respond out loud. Are you happy? Are you excited? Are you joyful? Do you have godly anticipation? If you don't have those things, it's because you're not doing what he created you to do. Hands down. Because when you're doing, when you find out what it is he wants you to do and you do it, the world can fall out from underneath you and you will be happy, you will be joyful, and you will be full. I can't imagine going through life without that assurance. So find out what that is. In Matthew 6, the Bible says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So the kingdom of God, this is fun. It's two things. Number one, seek first the kingdom. That's his politics. That's what it means. Seek first the politics of Jesus. What is that? He's king. King Jesus. John Adams always called Jesus King Jesus. I like that. King Jesus. That's right. He's king. What do, listen, what if, when, when kings say things, you do them. Right? Yes. Isn't it great that the Bible reveals to us that Jesus is king? It doesn't reveal him in any, it doesn't reveal him as president or senator or congress or prime minister king. I like that. See, I like that because I like his politics. His politics is love. His politics is joy, peace, kindness, gentleness, self-control, the fruit of the spirit. That's his politics. It's awesome. Number four, we're almost done. I know you guys are tired. He's coming for you, number four, so be ready for him. So be ready. And this is how we confirm that our faith is correct and that we are knowing him and that we're on the right path, is that we're ready for him. This 
is so important, yet so easily missed. If we're on the right path and we believe what his word says and that he's coming back for us and we don't know when, it could be at any time. How do I maintain this to be ready for him? 2 Corinthians 13, 5 says, examine yourselves to see or to determine whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Isn't that awesome? It, uh, the word, listen, the word examine means this, to uh, put yourself through the test. <laughs> Watch, it's to put yourself through the test. The word means to challenge your authenticity. Um, if you've ever been, and if you've never been, I encourage you to go. It's absolutely amazing. Go to Bodie, California. You ever heard of Bodie? Yes. How many of you have been to Bodie? Raise your hands. Oh, wow. Well, those of you who haven't, you got to go. Bodie, California. Uh, Northern California, just east of the 395. It's, it's way up there. It's like 8,300 feet high, so dress warm. In that location, by the way, everything's still standing. Everything's still standing. There's even letters and there's even at the assayer's office. This is my point. At the assayer's office, when you took your gold, you took it to the assayer's office and you put in the, the guides. It's all still there. You can read it. It's been there since like 1840, 1853. The guy brought in, you know, uh, by the way, true. Um, I forget his first name, but Mr. Levi and Mr. Strauss. Yep, that's where they, that's where they really? lived. Wow. They moved from San Francisco to Bodie. Why? Because people at Bodie, working at Bodie, they, be, they were the richest people on earth at that time. Bodie was producing more millionaires per week than any other place ever in human history for mining gold. It was so prolific that they didn't have wheelbarrows, so some guy invented a wheelbarrow that would work a lot better than what the carts that they were using. Do you know what the guy's name was? Studebaker. <laughs> Pants were wearing out because they were made of cotton, and so two guys, two Jewish guys, moved from San Francisco, gave up their careers, and they went to go mine for gold, and they, this has nothing to do with the Bible study. They were mining for gold and they wore their pants out so fast that they went back to San Francisco and invented denim. And they're called Levi Strauss, Levi's today. Zippers wouldn't work right, so they did button-ups. Levi Strauss. Then they kept breaking tools. They were finding so much gold, they were wearing out tools, pants and wheelbarrows. So some guy, listen... Some guy talked to his friend about, we need, to, we need to figure out how to build a new shovel, a different kind of shovel. And if we only had a thing like this, it would help a lot. What do you think, Mr. Roebuck? Well, I think we should do this, Mr. Sears. <laughs> Bodie, California. Why did I bring that up? Someone help me. I have no idea. <laughs> When you found gold, you took it to the assayer's office and they poured acid on it. And the acid washed everything away that wasn't gold. And the gold just became brilliant. And they said, congratulations. That's one nugget you have there. That's tremendous. The Bible says, examine yourselves. Pour the acid. Look, pour the acid on my life. See what's real. No one can do that except you, the believer in Christ Jesus will do this to themselves. They will look at themselves and they will say, when he comes, is he coming for me? I want to make sure, because I'm going to pour the acid of his word on my life to see what needs to be washed away, and I'm willing to see what's true and let it stand. That takes faith, friend, Amen. in him. Amen. Because you're willing to get that report card from him. You'll be ready. We don't, have to, we don't have to worry much at all about anything regarding his coming if you examine yourself. And then we end right here. Make sure that you're found by him. And I'll just end with this. I wish I had the time, but to be found by him. I did a little bit of study on sheep and goats. You know, goats will not follow easily or if at all the shepherd's voice. 
You know, goats are independent. They do their own thing. Did you know that goats will eat anything that's in front of them if they want to? You know, they're very uh, non-selective, non, non-critical about what they consume. Let me read this to you. One of the many differences between sheep and goats is how they eat. Sheep are grazers. They ramble slowly among particular plants close to the ground. Goats, on the other hand, are browsers. <laughs> browsers. Internet. Internet browsers. <laughs> they, they look for almost anything. When leaves, twigs, vines, and scrubs are not on the menu, they will consume just about anything that is convenient. Contrary, sheep are slow, methodical eaters, while goats can be agile in the pursuit of food and indiscriminate with their diet. Jesus said, you're either sheep or a goat. Listen, sheep, sheep have to be fed by the shepherd or they have to be eating under the shepherd's approval of a field or a hillside. Scientifically factual, sheep prove scientifically that God is the creator because evolution could never be true because we know that sheep cannot exist without a human being. Did you know that? Sheep cannot live without humans. They'll die. And just that argument alone debunks evolution because you couldn't have had sheep before humans. You can only have sheep because of a shepherd. A goat, on the other hand... They'll eat your purse. (laughs) They'll eat your wallet. But when you're found by him, it means this. It means that he knows you by name. That he knows you by name, my friend. And the tragic thing would be that at the end, can you imagine? You, you You die. Listen, in fact, I wrote this down. It sounds kind of terrifying, right? Watch this. This is what I wrote. As I look across the sanctuary, (laughs) I see that every single one of you will be meeting Jesus Christ in person in just a few years. Think of it. You say, I don't know if I like the way that sounds. (laughs) Doesn't matter. Because even if you live to be 100, it's only a few years compared to eternity. So it's true. As I look across the sanctuary, every single one of you will be meeting Jesus Christ personally. And so you want to make sure when he, when he sees you, will he see you with, his, with your name tag on? <laughs> hey, I know you. Can you imagine being in line what, and you're going, up to the, you're going up to the gates there and there's Peter, he's got a little clipboard. I don't know where he got that from. It's not in the Bible. <laughs> but can you imagine, you, what's your name? I had, a, I had a name tag in life. I don't know where my name tag is. I had it when I was living. Hmm. We'll see what happens when we get up there. But you look around and there's other people with name tags. Can you imagine? Mike, come on in. Welcome. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Jack, come on in. What's your name? Oh, Fred. Well, how do I know? It's Fred. There's no Fred here. Where's your name tag? I don't have one. I had one in life. But I noticed as soon as I died, I didn't have one. I'm sorry. You can't come in. Jesus gives you that name tag. The Bible says in the book of Revelation, he will give you a new name. I'm really glad about that. I'm done with Jack. I'm tired of it. (laughs) Listen, Listen, let's pray right now. But listen. How do you, are you going? Listen, you, he's coming for you. You will enter eternity in the next few years. What are you going to do about that? Heavenly Father, we come before you right now, Lord, and we ask, Almighty God, the gravity of this moment, the, the fact that you're coming for each and every one of us, it could be by death, it could be by rapture, Regardless, you're coming. 
And you have a date set. Your Bible tells us that all of our days, each of us, our days are numbered. And the moment of our passing is known to you. So dear friends, listen, I'm going to ask all of you this morning, if today, because of the seriousness of this moment, I beg of you, do not procrastinate this. Do not put it off. You have no guarantee. I'm not trying to manipulate you, and I'm not trying to put some sort of a psych trip on you. I just want to tell you how it is. You don't have any guarantee that you'll see the sunset tonight. And yet right now you have the opportunity to accept Christ as Lord and Savior. Died on the cross for your sins and rose again from the dead. You have to make that decision now in this world. The Bible makes it absolutely clear there is no second chance in the world to come. As we sing this song, I'm going to ask you to be honest with yourself. Stop thinking about others around you. In fact, your life has been crippled by the fear of others. Stop that. Fear God and respond to his offer that he'll give you eternal life if you accept him as Lord and Savior. And everybody Jesus invited to do that, he did it publicly. So I'm going to ask you as we sing this song for you to get up out of your seat and you come forward if you're giving your heart to Christ today. You're going to go public with Jesus. You need this commitment. You need this stand. You need to mark today that this is the day you went public for Jesus because you see that heaven is only available through him. And if you want Christ to come into your life, if anything that has been said today has struck true to your soul, that's the Holy Spirit speaking to you. Without delay, I'm going to ask you as we sing to get up and you come forward and then I'll lead all of you in prayer in a moment. Those of you who are standing right here, right now, this prayer I'm going to lead you in, mean it from your heart. Even though all of you are praying it, that's irrelevant. What matters is that you're praying to him and you're asking him to to receive you today. And there's a way that this happens as we pray. You pray coming to him. And so repeat this out loud if you would. Dear Lord Jesus, I come to you now and I ask you to receive me on the merits of your blood. I confess today that Jesus Christ died for me at the cross and that he rose again from the dead to purchase my salvation, to transform my life, to live in me now and from this day forward. Thank you. Hey everybody, as you can see, I'm here with our good friend Charlie Kirk and we are getting into the second part of us looking at the Tower of Babel and how that equates to this modern age of ours in light of Bible prophecy, what in the world is going on. And so we're looking forward to you staying tuned, letting others know that they can join us and study what does the Bible have to say to our current day. Charlie? Jack, loving the conversation and Love and being here. Genesis 11, and all actually the first 11 books of Genesis, right. speak a lot to our times and the distinctions that should dictate our reality. So I think everyone's going to enjoy. Incredible. Enjoy this, exactly. There's a reason why you cannot find America in the Bible. It's not written. How could that possibly be? The greatest, most powerful, most wealthy, most free, most you fill in the blank. How's it not written in the word? Well, guess what? If it's not written in the word and it happened, we're the only covenant nation, by the way, in the face of the earth outside of Israel. Israel has a covenant with God and our founding pilgrim has made a covenant with God. No other nation did this, but we're not specifically written in the Bible. Here's the point, is that if, if America's end is not specifically detailed, just like the birth is not mentioned, then could it be that God is saying, I see what's happening in Sacramento. I see what's happening in Washington, D.C., but will my people pray? 
Will the people of California, imagine if the good people in California decided, I'm going to do the right thing. Imagine what would happen here. And that could happen from state to state. Look, the Lord's coming back in his time. Until he does come back, as believers, we're supposed to do the right thing. And that right thing is what's really a disturbance to globalism and global union. Is there's this American thing. Yes. These people, they've got, they're full of ideas, they're full of ingenuity, they're, they're full of independence, and we need to break that down from them. And so man right now is trying to say, we've got God on the ropes. So what we'll do is, we'll create a world economic forum. And from that, we'll redefine faith. We'll redefine economies and we'll redraw the borders of nations. And we'll have groups come together. Isn't it interesting that the Bible told us 2,000 years ago that there'll be a gathering of leaders, world leaders. Book of Daniel, so that's 2,600 years ago. Book of Daniel called them horns. There'll be a, 10 horns, 10 leaders. Ten, horns in the Old Testament always refers to kings. There'll be 10 kings in the last days. And out of the 10 kings, there'll be an 11th one that will rise up seemingly out of nowhere. And the one that is called the 11th that comes out of the 10, he will destroy and he will take power. And the Bible tells us that he will engineer a one world economy. And you look what's going on. If you really want to get nations to this constant dripping we hear of, what's the word? Equity of the economic uh, parity. Everybody's the same. Equity. Equity. Think about that. How, how would you do that in the world? You reset with one currency. That's, that's how you do it. And, and that's likely coming very soon. Very Conversations soon. You'll about see a, it. You a, will see it. About a digital dollar, oh, about yeah. unifying currencies. It's very interesting. The Chinese Communist Party came out and they said, we don't want to be the world reserve currency. Uh, leave that to America. Is the financial instability that unfortunately a lot of you and a lot of us, all of us are really going to experience together is by design. And it's by design from, from the last couple of years. And this is a very important distinction. I think it actually should be rather freeing for you. You look at all that's happening. Who wants to be, you know, quote unquote, king of the garbage pile? You're destroying everything. That's so true. In your wake, right? Yeah. It, 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 it's totally against reason, which is a gift from God, as it, say in, it says in Isaiah 1. Yeah. Let us reason together. Right? You're breaking the border. You're breaking the economy. People are getting poor. 107,000 drug overdoses every single year. The leading cause of death for young girls ages 14 to 22 is suicide. We're allowing this trans thing, which is just a total affront to the distinctions of man versus woman, which just drives me, the whole trans thing drives me nuts. And this is spiritual that That's manifests right. temporarily Absolutely. in the physical. This is diabolical. That's right. Okay? And I did a whole thing today on my show, and boy, you want to get mocked by CNN, you want to get mocked by all the guys, and we said this That's on our show today. That's an honor to be mocked I, 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 by, by the way, <laughs> one day they'll realize I enjoy it a lot more than they do when they write up. Yeah. It, it's, it really is great. And as long as they quote me accurately, when they don't, that drives me nuts. That's separate. Uh, you can say whatever you want, just don't lie about me. But the one thing I did get right about today is that I was talking about how witchcraft and the occult is a real thing, yeah. and there are portals to darkness, and you have to be vigilant about this, and that I believe that there are leaders... Wait, they in, made fun of that? Oh, the mockery, Jack. Who are you to say all that? I mean, uh, because, well, it's kind of interesting. They make fun of it because no one actually wants to say that out loud, that we're in the midst of the high, most consequential spiritual war. I think of, of a millennia, right? No one wants to say that out loud. But then there's the scientific materialists that will say, oh yeah, there's no invisible realm or domain. They call themselves atheists. They're, they're, they're not, they just, yeah, that's, you know, they're, they're lost. But it's really interesting though, Jack, there is no other way to explain the campaign of arson and destruction against our country other than diabolical, spiritually dark influences that are fighting right. for dominion over this nation. And let me just add a little bit of a wrinkle to this, and Jack, you can riff. This is why 
I have lost my patience. I am now in a patience deficit, okay? So you say, how can I pray for you, Charlie? Pray for patience, of which I am, I am I'm taking out a loan on patience, okay? With, by the way, I have plenty of patience for atheists, for secularists, for even some liberals. I have no patience for people who call themselves pastors who won't engage in the spiritual war that is happening around them every single day. No patience, I'm done. Yeah, amen. And I, I'll, I'll just add one more thing to it. I talked to a, a pastor the other day, and I will not say his name. And he says, I, he said, it's not, it's not clear to me kind of what the way forward is. I'm, he said, I'm going to need more time to figure it out. And I lost it. I'll be very honest, right? Again, fruit of the spirit is self-control. I temporarily put that one on pause. And um, I, I, I acknowledge my sins publicly so you could pray for me and I repent. No, it's, I, I could have handled it better. I said, really? Oh, you need more time. Three years into a virus that we funded in Wuhan, mainland China, deployed on the entire world. We put kids out of school and they're killing themselves at record rates. Our border is wide open. They shut down, they shut down schools and jail pastors, keep strip clubs and marijuana dispensaries and alcohol, uh, alcohol stores open. They deem you non-essential. We have abortion on demand. We're medically mutilating kids and you need like more time to figure it out. Like you should resign from the ministry. That's Sorry, right. pal. That, no, that's true. You don't, you don't repent from that. You don't, you don't repent from that. That's no, absolute no. truth. You see, you see, Jack says, I don't need to repent. I just gave you a much nicer version, okay? <laughs> it was, um, Look, I don't know. It was a lot I, more spirited. I, I think, no, it was spirited, okay? I, I think Charlie's being hard on himself. Look what Nehemiah did. He grabbed people by the beard and drugged them out in the street and kicked them out. So I can do that. Great. So 100% true. If you stop and, and look at the issues that are happening, for all of us, I don't care how young you are, I don't care how old you are, this is the first time in world history that what's going on is going on at the same time globally at the exact same moment. What's happening here is happening in Ireland. It's happening in Mozambique. It's happening in Peru. The culture is under attack. All of a sudden, people are waking up or falling asleep, and they're saying, um, I don't know if I'm a boy or a girl now. Now, it's not nothing to laugh about. It's satanic. Here's the reason why. Listen. That's exactly right. It's satanic. Because why? Genesis 1. God said, I made you in my image. Satan knows this. So he's attacking, and I'll prove it. What's the result when a child has been told to question their gender? What is the result? Most often suicide, if not self-mutilation. What's going on here? Satanic. And we don't do anybody any favors by saying, oh, well, that's good for you. You know what we're saying? We're saying, you can establish your own truth then. I'll have my truth. You can, they can all have theirs and the other. That's insanity. It's demonic. You say, how can that possibly be? Jesus said that before he comes back, there's going to be a profound time of deception. These are the doctrines of demons. You don't have to guess. Wow, I read that in my Bible, that in the last days there's going to be doctrines of demons and, and, and uh, deceiving spirits. I wonder what that's going to be like. <laughs> You're in it. This is it. I don't believe that America's hope in recovery, if that's what's to happen, is going to happen through any political power. I've never believed that. People want me to wear that badge. I won't wear it. Remember, Air, uh, what did I say a long time ago? The Messiah is not going to be arriving on Air Force One. Yeah, that's right. Just know that. And Jesus will never be on the ballot. Okay, he's not running. So here's the thing. Until he does come back, you're supposed to do the right thing. That's called being a Christian. That's called shining the light. Yeah, amen. That's called being salt. You can't sit it out. If you're an idle Christian, a spectator Christian, that's a serious problem. You've got to change that. You've got to get involved. I travel the country, and the people that I'm so inspired, I, I was just saying this on the way over, that never give up are California Christian patriots, that you have every reason to give up and to be demoralized because you're quote-unquote outnumbered. Understand, you've already made a sizable and measurable difference and impact. The other, country, the other parts of the country, in Missouri or Indiana, 
they're profusely thanking you for being able to at least move over one chamber of Congress. But again, it goes back to what I said. If you go through the subversion tactics that are being used against you, which I believe, yes, are partly diabolical, if you read the literature of the KGB agents that used to do this professionally, Yuri Bezmenov was one of the most mm -hmm. um, Text public. Yep, yeah, we did, we, we, we've done plenty line of podcasts on him. He says, a nation that will go from capitalistic or free to Marxist or unfree must go through stages. And these stages are not mistakes, they're by design. That's right. Now understand, his full-time job, Yuri Bezmenov, used to go into countries like Rhodesia, formerly Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. He'd go into countries and try to turn them from a free society to a Soviet Marxist government. That was his job. His job was to come in, do an analysis of the landscape, find out their weak points, find out how to destabilize them. So it's destabilization, then demoralization, okay? He said destabilization's easy. He said we could do that, you know, that's wreck right. a currency, destroy an economy, he said, that's, that, that's simple. He said the part though that's tough is breaking the resolve of the people that inhabit the country you're trying to take over. He said that's the challenge. And so they had to work at it. How do you do it? You take out leaders like James O'Keefe, right? You unfairly go after and put people in prison like what they're trying to do right now to President Trump, right? Intimidate. You shut up their voice, which is the censorship, censorship regime that we've seen, right? Yeah. You unfairly go after the businesses that are financing it, which is what, of course, they're trying to do. And more than anything else, you make the cost of believing greater than the cost of giving up. Meaning, you make sure people suffer if they continue to believe the nation has any hope. Also, you medicate the society. That was part of it too, by the way. Mass medication, which legalization mm -hmm. of weed, all these antidepressants, all that stuff, which is, that, that's part of it. And so then he says, look, if you're able to get through the demoralization, the country is going to fall. You are living through a planned attempt to demoralize your opinion of America. That's right. I think it's actually freeing to know that that's what they're doing to you. Everything you see on TV, everything you see on social media, look through the lens of, this is a planned attempt to get me to give up. Mm -hmm. Am I going to do that? You might say, well, you know, we don't get involved in politics. You, listen, what do you mean by that? Literally, honestly. You say that because you heard someone say that. You don't believe that. You just, you don't want to get involved, so you say that. It's like the pastor who says, I just preached the gospel. When pastors tell me that, I tell them, you need to repent. Yeah, that's right. Because you're supposed to teach the full counsel of God. After somebody's evangelized, which is preaching the gospel, then you, the, the rest of the book is making disciples out of, out of them. How to live the life that you just now received from Christ. Okay, but see, we live in a culture where there's a bunch of saved people and that's as far as they've gone. That's if they're even saved. And you wonder, because if you ask them, how did Jesus save you? What happened when you were saved? What does it mean? What did he do on the cross? If you don't know the answers to that, then it didn't happen to you. Think about it. If you can't define what you believe in, then what is it that you believe in? So here we are. Well, we don't get involved. You have to get involved because the alternative is apathy. That's what you're saying. You are justifying apathy. When God says, I want you, listen to this, because you love me, the world's going to hate you, but don't be bummed about it. The world hated me before they'll ever hate you. So let me ask you something. Are you hated? I'm talking about in the world that you live in, the people that you have influence over, do they hate you because... You love God. Do they hate you because they can't rattle your cage? You pray for them. Do they hate you because when they're sick, you come and bring them soup? Jesus said, if you love me, they're going to hate you. Don't you want to be like Jesus? I want to be like Jesus. But it's really a strange thing because he was the most loved person that ever graced this planet at the same time he's the most hated how is it your name is not a curse word but his is now is the time for us to shine 
the glory of the kingdom of God, we happen to live in America. Right now, we happen to have some freedom to do that still. We don't have the freedoms we had 10 years ago or five years ago. Do you understand we are gradually losing these freedoms? What will you do when the freedom is gone and your chance and opportunity is over and you have no, no voice anymore? You're going to say, I wish I would have said something when I could have. Now's the time. I believe it was C.S. Lewis. I'm not sure. I think it's C.S. Lewis who said that I have found out in my life that the people who believe that heaven was the closest did the most in the world in the here and now. What a motivator. I could be in heaven tomorrow. What that means is I want to do everything I can that's right for the kingdom so that if he comes for us all or for my life, I will be getting caught being busy about my father's business. That's what you want to do. That's what we want to do together with you. Yes, please. I'm going to give two very simple action items that I've never shared at this church before. It's so simple. It's do not lie and don't let people lie to you. you those, do, those two things. That's great. It's way harder than you think. Mm. That right there will put you on an alignment politically, morally. Don't lie and don't let people lie to you. You might say, well, Charlie, I, I don't let people lie to me. Wow. Okay. You don't let people in your local school district lie to your kids about sexual perversion. You don't let your relatives lie about God and Jesus and the Bible. Mm. Do you stand up and say something with courage and boldness? The most important one is, of course, first, you not lying. And the best way to do that is to follow Jesus. Because he didn't just say true things. He was the truth, is the truth. Yeah. And he sets you free. The society right now feels like it's falling apart because of intentional demoralization, but also because Satan, the author of lies, needs to be able to channel deceit in every possible corner. Our greatest weapon is the truth. Absolutely. And that means you have to be brutally honest with yourself. Am I really doing enough to try to pass a free society onto my grandkids? Don't lie to yourself. Maybe yes, maybe not. Am I really doing that? And if the answer is yes, terrific. The answer for most people is no. Mm. Am I really getting into uncomfortable situations to share the gospel every day with somebody I don't know? Find a stranger, tell them about Jesus. You doing that every day? Check out lines at grocery store, taxi cab drivers, flight attendants. Hey, you're having a tough day. Do you believe in Jesus? Oh, that's too uncomfortable. You're going to see them again. Why not? Are you getting to a place of uncomfortability? That, that kind of movement of evangelism, of the spreading of truth, <laughs> I'll tell you, it, it's, it's an action item that all of us can do instantaneously. So, look, I, I get accused of a lot of things. I have plenty of enemies, Jack. And sometimes, my, the, the, sometimes I get criticism from other Christians. And they say, you're hateful, you're all this sort of things. None of that is true. But I say, look, I have two rules. I will not lie to myself, and I will not lie to my audience. And if that offends you or if that bothers you, then the truth bothers you. And you got much deeper problems than that. But what, if I can do one thing for all of you tonight, I can hopefully inspire or encourage you, you will be a happier, more joyful person the more you speak the truth. That is so powerful, 100% true. Wow, what an amazing time of information and biblical instruction. And I love that about the Bible. You should too. That's why we're coming to you on these broadcasts, the Word of God consistent with the world around us at this very moment. The things that are happening now in our world have been prophesied in the Word of God. It doesn't take a spiritual Einstein to figure out that as you look around to see what's happening in our education, in our economy, in our politics, in our education of all areas, broad spectrum, Things that are once stable are now unstable. Things that were once defined and you knew them as one thing are now something completely different. Evil is good, good is evil. What was for clarity is now labeled as confusion. An amazing time, but don't panic, don't worry. The very Bible that Charlie and I were leaning to 
to look at the world events around us served us and serves us now, right? And you as a lens. When we look through the world events through the lens of the Bible, we discover that God's in control, that nothing happening in the world around us is an accident, that kings are installed and kings as it were are deposed. Um, you've got presidents rising and falling. You've got prime ministers uh, going up and going down. You've got governments coming together, and as soon as they do, we've got governments coming apart. Don't lose heart, friends. Jesus said that when he comes, it will be likened unto the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, and as it was in the days of Noah. And so as we've been learning from Genesis 11, we live in critical times. We'll see more of you and you can see more of us at jackhibbs.com. Until next time, God bless you.